Today I'm going to show you how to make a lovely purple pigment called Cobalt Violet. Cobalt Violet was invented in 1859 and was the very first permanent violet pigment available to artists. Its original formula was cobalt arsenate made by combining cobalt with highly toxic arsenic, and as a consequence it was extremely poisonous. However, since most pigments back then were similarly toxic, cobalt violet found widespread use among impressionist painters and was used to create many of the most famous pieces of the time. Luckily nowadays, most cobalt violets are made of cobalt phosphate or cobalt ammonium phosphate and are a lot safer to handle. I'll talk about these formulas a little bit more later in the video, but for now, let's go ahead and get started. To make a standard cobalt violet, I began by dissolving 34 grams of cobalt sulfate heptahydrate in an arbitrary volume of water. In a separate beaker, I then mixed up a dilute solution of alkaline ammonium phosphate. In theory, this could be done by simply dissolving triammonium phosphate directly in water. However, in practice, tribasic ammonium phosphate is very unstable and rarely ever sold. Instead, I simply dissolved 19 grams of diammonium phosphate in some water and added concentrated ammonium hydroxide until the pH was around 9. This represents a notable excess of phosphate relative to what's required for the reaction, which I've found helps really maximize the final yield. Anyway, once my two mixtures were complete, the next step was to simply add the cobalt sulfate mixture directly to the alkaline ammonium phosphate. This can be done all at once, but I decided to make the addition slowly to better capture the beautiful double replacement. Without any mixing, the solid immediately forms as these little purple blobs that quickly sink to the bottom of the beaker. You'll notice here that at first, the precipitate is a very cool purple, and that as I continue to add cobalt sulfate, it gradually begins to redshift. This type of color shifting happens pretty often with cobalt compounds, and it's due to cobalt's tendency to interchange between tetrahedral and octahedral complexes. Anyway, once all the cobalt sulfate had been added, I went ahead and allowed the mixture to continue reacting under constant stirring for a few minutes before passing the whole thing through my Buchner funnel. This will collect my precipitated cobalt ammonium phosphate, while any unreacted reagents, as well as the byproduct ammonium sulfate, will pass right through. I next went ahead and rinsed the cake of cobalt phosphate thoroughly with some distilled water, which again caused the color to blue shift. I pulled a vacuum on this stuff for a few more minutes to remove as much water as I could and then transferred it to a dish to dry. After about a week, my cobalt phosphate paste had dried completely, and I was left with a light pink and very brittle solid. This is cobalt ammonium phosphate hexahydrate, which on its own is sometimes used as cobalt violet. However, I prefer the more blue-toned and hydrous cobalt violet, which requires one more step to make. To dehydrate cobalt ammonium phosphate hexahydrate to its anhydrous form, I began by simply crushing it up into a mostly uniform pink powder. This stuff is a whole lot more durable than it looks, and so this actually took a good deal of effort. Once I had finally crushed it up as finely as I felt I could manage, I simply transferred the powder to a borosilicate glass dish and placed it on my hot plate. I then ramped up the heat to around 350 degrees Celsius and held it there until all of the pink had completely shifted to a deep violet. At this point, I went ahead and cut the heat, allowed it to cool down to room temperature, and then crushed up my now anhydrous cobalt phosphate even further using my mortar and pestle. The powder was next transferred to a beaker of 8% acetic acid and mixed thoroughly for about a half hour. This is done to remove any cobalt that hadn't fully fixed to the phosphate, and it helps to stabilize the final pigment. This was then collected one final time in my Buchner funnel, rinsed thoroughly with distilled water, and transferred to a new dish to dry. This time I dried the powder overnight in my vacuum desiccator, and when I came back the next day, I found that the completely dry cobalt violet had lightened up noticeably and taken on a somewhat chalky consistency. I went ahead and weighed this for a final mass of 18.82 grams, which represents a 91% yield of the theoretical. As a quick side note, I've never really been able to get this particular reaction up past around 85-90% to yield, and I'm honestly not certain how to get it to go any higher. Making sure the pH stays above 8 and below 12 by adding a little extra ammonia during the precipitation step seems to be the most important factor in maximizing yield. This is because cobalt ammonium phosphate is somewhat soluble in acidic or alkaline mixtures, and is least soluble between a pH of 6 and 9.5. However, if you want to just make regular cobalt phosphate with no ammonium, you can simply maintain a pH of 12. Anyway, now that I had my final pure cobalt violet, it's time to see how this stuff works as a paint. 
To do this, I begin by adding a small scoop of cobalt violet directly to a ground glass plate followed by a few drops of linseed oil. I then use a palette knife to mix the two together as thoroughly as possible. At this point, I switch to using a molar to grind the pigment into the oil while simultaneously crushing the cobalt phosphate into even smaller particles. This is continued for about 25 minutes until I felt like I had a decent paint consistency going on. I then went ahead and swatched my new violet paint directly onto a piece of paper that I'd pre-treated with gesso. You can also see here that I'd previously swatched some manganese violet, and I'll have a video for how to make that pigment coming out within the next couple weeks, hopefully. Anyway, as you can see, cobalt violet is a beautiful purple pigment that works wonderfully as a paint, whether in oil or water medium. The biggest downside of this particular pigment is that it's fairly transparent with very low tinting strength. This can be desirable, notably in watercolor paints, but paired with its extremely high production cost, cobalt violet was widely replaced by the cheaper and more pigmented manganese violet in 1890. Now, looking at these two pigments, you might think, hey, cobalt violet looks nothing like manganese violet, so how could manganese violet ever have worked as a replacement? This is because at the time, the cobalt phosphate violet that I made today didn't yet exist, and instead the highly toxic cobalt arsenate was the only cobalt violet available. The arsenic variant of this pigment is now known as cobalt violet light, and it looks like this. As you can see, this is a lot more similar to manganese violet, which makes it a lot easier to see why we got rid of this expensive, transparent, and highly toxic pigment altogether. Despite this, the phosphate version of the cobalt violet I made in this video is still widely used to this day. The relatively low tinting strength and high cost are still notable downsides, but the specific hue of cobalt violet is nearly impossible to replicate by mixing other pigments. It also lightens up very nicely with titanium white, which has the added benefit of offsetting the streaking effect you get with the pure pigment. Honestly, I'm not an artist, so I can't really say what would be preferable here. All I know is that I think cobalt violet is a lovely pigment and one of my favorites to make. In any case, that's all I have for today. If you found this video interesting, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and let me know in the comments if you want to see more pigment videos like this one. As always, I want to give a sincere thank you to all of my members here on YouTube, as your support is vital in funding the work I do here. Before I go, I did want to quickly acknowledge and apologize for my somewhat irregular upload schedule these days. Long story short, I took on a few projects over the last few months that ended up taking far more time than I'd expected or planned for and it completely threw me off track. I am happy to report that they have eventually all worked out, and to give you guys a quick sneak preview, here are the projects I've been working on the last few months. As for when I'll have videos out on these, I did end up with over 4 hours of footage for both manganese blue and isolating metals from rechargeable batteries, so those might take a little while to edit down. Ethylene diamine from antifreeze and the anti-seizure medication are both organic chem, so a whole lot less work and hopefully I'll have them out a lot sooner. For the monstrous element videos I've been making, I still need to whip up some chromal chloride for my chromium video and use the ethylene diamine to make a few complexes for the cobalt video, but those are almost done as well. Anyway, stay tuned if any of those sound interesting to you, and as always, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.